Well, all right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, on behalf of Four Paws International, uh, and with the support of the uh, Australian Permanent Mission here at the UN in Geneva, uh, I have the great pleasure to welcome you to our roundtable discussion, our roundtable discussion here today. Taking One Health seriously. What are the concrete steps to build an effective pandemic instrument? That's our topic today, and it's very, well, it's a large topic and a very exciting and very current topic, certainly, and we're very proud uh, to bring together today high-level experts and member states. So, actually, this roundtable discussion is intended to provide high-level expert insights on One Health and pandemic prevention. Uh, and on the other hand, it is, uh, well, today a forum for discussion, for your questions, for, uh, yeah, discussion and interaction, share knowledge and uh, exchange on key questions. So, uh, we do value a lot your participation in today's event. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we will give a special focus today on uh, to the importance of One Health and uh, prevention, which address the drivers of infectious diseases and spillover events, uh, where pathogens actually jump from animals to humans. And, uh, well, we certainly hope that this discussion will be a positive contribution to uh, the development of con conceptual zero draft of the Convention Agreement or other international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Well, we do have, as I said, a very interesting and, uh, topic and afternoon ahead of us. And as for the agenda, just that you know, um, during the uh, uh, next hour, as for the next hour, we'll do an expert discussion right here in front. We have two online uh, experts joining us and the three gentlemen who are right here behind me. And uh, we will start with One Health from the scientific side and then look at the legal architecture in a second step. And after that, we will thank the guests listening via live stream and say goodbye and uh, Ask those guests who are here with us in the room to contribute all your questions, contributions, and uh, interact with our experts. And, um, well, we do that under Chatham House rules. So, just to let you know, uh, no one afterwards will know who the question asked. So, and around 4.45, we'll conclude this and uh, have time for informal discussions and certainly also a little bit of drinks and food. And, uh, well, we value if you participate in that as well. Well, last but not least, my name is Corinna Egera. I'm a, a professional moderator in the fields of business and politics, and uh, I have the great pleasure to guide you through the next one and a half hours here together. So, I now have the uh, great pleasure to announce uh, two, um, uh, well, actually, welcome remarks, I should say, and it's first, the first one comes from the Ambassador of Australia to the United Nations here in Geneva, Her Excellency Amanda Gorley. Well, the floor is yours. Amen. That's good. Thank you very much. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, civil society-led event, a roundtable discussion on taking One Health seriously. What are the concrete steps to build an effective pandemic instrument? Australia is very pleased to be co-hosting this event with Four Paws, which is an organisation that has been reaching out to many of you to discuss the importance of One Health as we work to reset the global architecture for pandemic pre prevention, preparedness and response. I want to thank Four Paws for organising this event and bringing together such an eminent panel of experts to discuss this important topic. And in a moment, I'll hand over to the Four Paws board member, Gerald Dick. But first, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the hard work of the Four Paws team, particularly Nelson, who I can see at the back of the room there, Nina, um, and especially Julia, who have all worked very hard to bring us together today. Uh, colleagues, One Health is a core component of the global health reform agenda and a key priority for Australia. 
For some time now, we have been working to strengthen our own One Health approaches and to support others in our region to do so. One of our efforts is our Research for One Health System Strengthening Program, which is bringing together leading Australian and regional researchers to address issues at the critical interface between people, animals and the environment. We are bolstering our domestic pandemic prevention, detection and early response capabilities through a dedicated One Health surveillance initiative, which will support prevention, detection and mitigation of the impacts of emerging animal diseases, including those with pandemic potential. We are working across government to ensure a joined up approach and many of you will have met Australia's Chief Medical Officer, Dr Paul Kelly in May and I hope many of you will also have the opportunity to meet our Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr Mark Shipp, who will visit Geneva next Monday for discussions on this very topic that the roundtable today is looking at. Australia recognises that to be truly effective, One Health must be a global approach. An estimated 60% of pathogens that cause human disease originate from domestic animals, livestock and wildlife, and 75% of emerging human pathogens are of animal origin. A One Health approach is therefore essential for domestic, regional and global health security and the prevention of future zoonotic disease outbreaks and pandemics. Emphasising our collective commitment to a One Health approach through multilateral agreements, such as the pandemic instrument we are now negotiating, is an essential step to ensure we are better prepared to respond to or better prevent the next pandemic. It is critical to ensure there are tangible commitments to One Health in the new instrument. I want to acknowledge and affirm the leadership of the quadripartite in One Health approaches and governance. I welcome members of the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health who are all here with us today. We are also privileged to have experts from the One Health high level expert panel as speakers. We look forward to your ongoing leadership and engagement in this area and to working together closely as the new instrument takes shape. Welcome all and thank you for engaging in today's discussion. It's so important that our negotiations are informed by experts and that we listen to civil society and that we take the time to exchange with one another and build common understanding and shared commitment to the difficult task ahead. I'll now hand the floor to Mr Gerald Dick. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Honourable Ambassador Gorelli, for your very kind introduction and your kind words, and also for supporting this gathering, this important gathering uh, today. But first, I would like to express condolences on the passing of Queen Elizabeth. Our deepest sympathies are with the people in Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, and all the Commonwealth countries. Coming back to, to our topic of today, I think we all realize that globally we are in the middle of a big crisis. It's a biodiversity crisis, it's a climate crisis. And I think we have realized that also pandemics are intrinsically related to both and have a direct impact on human health. And that's exactly where the concept of one human health is coming in by combining and optimizing the health for humans, animals and ecosystems. So as for PAWS, we are a global animal welfare organization and are prepared to support member states because most of the emerging infectious diseases are zoonoses, meaning pathogens are jumping and passed on from animals to humans. So for our meeting today, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you, ambassadors, secretaries, delegates, participants, 
here in Geneva, but of course also the ones joining us via live stream. And uh, I think a special welcome also goes to our experts for their valuable input and contributions. And with that, I would like to hand over back to Corinna and to the topic how One, animal, uh, one Health uh, can be taken seriously. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, Excellency. Thank you, Gerald. And uh, yes, we will now... Uh, turn to the expert roundtable, our roundtable discussion. And uh, we start, as I said before, with the uh, scientific uh, side on One Health. So our first, actually our first contribution is, uh, was recorded yesterday um, for time reasons. And, uh, but uh, I, our first speaker will be Natalia Sejiel, and she's lecturer and researcher from the Universidad de Salle. Bogota in Colombia, and she's a member of the One Health High Level Expert Panel. So as I said, we recorded her statement yesterday, and um, she answered the following question. As a One Health practitioner and veterinary, veterinary uh, and public health scientist, what types of measures do you believe are needed at the human-animal interface so that the pandemic instrument enables governments and communities more effectively prevent the next pandemic. Natalia, I say the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you to Four Paws for this invitation to share and to talk about the pandemic instrument and how we can really prevent the next pandemic. Um, there has been many definitions about One Health along the last 25, 30 years uh, in the published literature um, among the academic institutions and international organizations. The concept is not new since the link between the health of human, animals, and the environment has been described and studied for centuries, especially focused on those diseases shared among animals and humans. This, these diseases are called zoonosis. But the value of the new definition released by the One Health High Expert Level Panel in 2021 has huge relevance because it moves from the anthropocentric focus of previous definitions towards a more ecocentric definition, more ecocentric focus, because that definition recognizes that the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment are closely linked and interdependent. So, however, the last pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, demonstrates the urgent need to apply and translate the concept into action, to go beyond the theory into implementation, especially in tropical and subtropical systems, like most developing countries, like Latin America, Asia, or Africa. In countries like the one where I live, there are social, economic, and environmental drivers that create disease emergence. That disease emergence came from close contact between wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. This is called the human-animal ecosystem interface. The anthropogenic changes are key drivers for disease emergence and its spread. Literature has pointed out seven anthropocentric drivers that are most likely driving the emergence of zoonotic diseases. The first one is increasing human demand for animal protein. The second is unsustainable agricultural intensification. The third is increased use and exploitation of wildlife. <clears throat> the fourth is unsustainable utilization of natural resources accelerated by urbanization, land use change, and extractive industries. Five, increased travel and transportation. Six, changes in food supply. And seven, climate change. <clears throat> However, a pandemic effective instrument to reduce the risk of a spillover should focus on four main measures or activities or programs. 
First, we should and must protect tropical and subtropical forests. Many studies show that changes in the way the land is used might be the largest driver of emerging infectious diseases of zoonotic origin globally. Wildlife that survive forest degradation tends to include species that can live alongside people that often host pathogens capable of infecting humans. Also, the loss of forest is driving climate change. That is another crisis that we have already. This could in itself add a spillover by pushing animals, such as bats and other mammals, out of the regions that have become inhospitable and into areas where many people live. The second uh, is commercial markets and trade of life wild animals that pose a public health risk must be banned or strictly regulated, both domestically and internationally. Restrictions on urban and peri-urban commercial markets, however, needs and must not infringe the rights of indigenous communities and local communities because they often rely on wildlife for food security, livelihood, and cultural practices. There are many examples already in Brazil, Canada, and the United States that there are different rules for hunting depending on the community. The third measure is biosecurity. We must improve uh, all the measures when dealing with farm animals. We need to do efforts to create better veterinary care, enhance surveillance of animal diseases, improvements to feeding and housing animals, quarantines to limit pathogen spread. I'll, however, and in general, be aware of animal welfare. Poor health, this is why, this is why we need to do it. Anim to improve animal welfare, because poor health among farm animals increase the risk of becoming infected with pathogens, obviously, and spread them. And nearly 80% of livestock pathogens can infect multiple host species, um, host species, including wildlife and humans. And four, we need to improve the people's health and economic security in vulnerable places. The particularly the hot spots for emerging of infectious diseases occur in places where there are social vulnerability. People in poor health, such as those who have malnutrition, those who have uncontrolled HIV infection, can be more susceptible of zoonotic pathogens. So providing communities with education, with tools to reduce the risk of harm is crucial. We need system-oriented interventions. We cannot do it by one sector alone. We need the One Health approach to really prevent the next pandemic. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you have questions or you want to share more. I'd be willing to, to talk and share. Well, <laughs> yes, you can have a lot, <laughs> even though she doesn't hear us. But I'm still saying, Natalia Shidia, thank you very much to the Universidad in uh, Bogota, in Colombia, and her statement. And uh, well, we will continue with our second uh, contribution. And uh, that one comes from Wanda Morkata. She's director at the Central for Viral Zoonoses at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the uh, University of Pretoria in South Africa. And she is co-chair of, of the One Health High Level Expert panel. So she's online as well, but she's uh, in a live stream with us. So we should be able to see her right now, I hope at least. So are you there, Wanda? Do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Are you getting me? Yes, yeah, so very well. Welcome from Geneva. Great Can to you have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, Wanda, um, many governments are calling for the inclusion of the concept of One Health uh, in the pandemic instrument. The working draft does not yet explicitly include the OLAP One Health definition. Could you maybe just elaborate why the OLAP concept of One Health is important and how it can be implemented? 
and uh, maybe later on uh, also add if it should be included into the legal instrument for, in your opinion. Okay, thank you and thank you for this opportunity. So I will speak mostly from my role as co-chair of OLAP and not so much as director of the Center for Vital Zoonosis, but it, it overlaps. And I, I wanted to just show a few diagrams to make a few points um, while I speak to make it clearer. clearer. And I think we heard from the previous speakers that, that it's clear that we cannot continue the way we did in the past um, if we really want to prevent and prepare and respond to pandemics. So we really need to look at things differently. And the, the reason for this is this diagram that you see here, there's just more and more outbreaks. Um, some of them turn into pandemics. There's shorter time periods between them. And if we look at any predictions for the future, this is just going to continue if we continue on the same path. And that's why we're having these discussions about an international instrument, why are we talking again about one-off definitions, and all kinds of other discussions that's going on in, in the global environment. So Natalia also referred to the One Health definition, and One Health is not new, but recently the One Health um, High-Level Expert com uh, Committee um, together with the Quadripartite, released a, a new definition on One Health. And I want to highlight a few things here because I think that is important if we talk about an a international um, instrument for prevention, preparedness, and response. So the One Health definition is really about healthy ecosystem, healthy animals, and healthy humans. So it's an integrated approach that you need to follow, um, and it, it leads to sustainable solutions. What's a bit different from, from this definition or highlighted compared to some of the previous definitions is that we need to include sectors and disciplines like we saw in um, all previous definitions, but society needs to be an integral part of this. So it's really also involving communities on varying levels of society. And that's also true if we talk about other instruments in terms of, of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So in this process of uh, addressing things from a one-off perspective going forward and really implementing it on the ground, we will also have other benefits. So for instance, if we address um, ecosystem, healthy animals and healthy humans, we're also going to address the collective need for clean water, energy, air, let's say, nutritious food, and also in the, in the process, even climate change. So it's really a, a holistic approach that's got a lot of advantages. I want to go to the next slide because when we developed this definition, there was very, very important principles that goes with the definition and, and they are mentioned here on this um, um, slide. And these are also important if we talk about the, the instrument for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And one is equity and specifically equity uh, between all the sectors and disciplines, socio-political parity, which is really recognizing that all people are equal, deserve equal rights. There need to be opportunities and engagement with communities and marginalized voices. If we look at the socio-ecological equilibrium, there needs to be a balance between animal, human, and environmental health. The one shouldn't be more important. And um, stewardship and responsibility really goes about humans must adopt sustainable solutions for some of these problems that we have going forward. And then it is transdisciplinarity and multi-sectoral collaboration that will make this work. So it really needs to include modern and tra traditional um, knowledge, all disciplines that's, that's relevant, and a range of perspectives. And I think these principles are, are really important if we talk about One Health. The other thing that I want to highlight that I think is missing in a lot of these discussions is prevention. And I, I like this um, diagram that I borrowed from a pub publication that was recently published that really shows what we talk about with prevention, because we, we talk a lot about preparedness and response, but we forget about prevention. And prevention is really where the focus is on preemptive measures to stop spillovers in the first place. And we need to also focus on this. We can't just focus on preparedness when the disease is already in the human population. And this is where One Health, although One Health is important in all these pillars, but One Health is really also important in prevention because this is where we bring in a lot of the environmental issues, um, human behavior issues, things like biodiversity loss. Um, Natalia mentioned a lot of others. We need to look at land use, unsustainable agriculture production and intensification. And all of this is, is really important. So why? 
So I'm just going to look at a few examples. If we start looking at, at some nice economic models that's coming out, it's very clear that if we do invest in prevention and not just in preparedness and response, that there's cost benefits. It's even got um, additional benefits. For instance, if you look at deforestation, if you can reduce that, you're also going to reduce carbon emission and there's um, uh, specific financial incentives in that if you start modeling this. It's also very clear from some of the recent work that's been published, if we do even just prevent outbreaks by 50%, we're going to save 1.6 million lives. We're going to save trillion dollars in terms of, of mortality um, costs. And it costs much less to prevent than to respond on a pandemic. So, so all of this, um, I think, needs to be clear if we start talking about an instrument for pandemic um, prevention, preparedness, and response, that we really look at all of these pillars. We recognize why it's important. And we really look at a one health approach that should be the foundation of an instrument like this, not just the recommendation or mention, but it really should, should be the foundation of, of the discussions. It's also linked to some of the activities that the quadripartite is currently involved in. There's a, a joint plan of action of One Health in draft. And it's important that we align all instruments at this point on a global level. Otherwise, implementation will not be practical or sustainable. So we really need to open these conversations and, and try and incorporate fundamental principles in terms of how we're going to go forward if we talk about prevention, preparedness, and response. Thank you. Me? Yes, no. Thank you very much, Wanda. And I know you are going to stay with us for the discussion later, so uh, we will see you uh, in a little while again. Well, and uh, now I have the pleasure to welcome my three experts here on uh, the live stage. And uh, we will start uh, our next contribution with uh, Karan Kukreya, and uh, he's veterinary scientist and head of public campaign Southeast Asia at Four Pulse. And uh, well, Karan, I, uh, of course I have a question for you as well. <laughs> um, the concept of One Health actually talks about our relationship to animals and nature. Um, I just said, you're a veterinary scientist and uh, have worked with the World Organization on Animal Health and on Animal Welfare in Asia. Uh, so, in your view, what should member states actually focus on to, tell, well, to take One Health seriously? Thank you for the question. Um and thank you everyone for coming today. First, I'd like to just go through that looking at this pandemic, it is important to always remember the impact. We've lost six and a half million plus lives. We've lost between eight to 15 trillion dollars. That's the most recent estimates. And one of the saddest things is we've also lost so much, so much progress in the fight against HIV, in the fight against malaria. So it goes beyond just the direct losses to COVID-19. Now, <clears throat> and, this, and the saddest thing for me is that this has happened before. Maybe not to this extent, but it's happened before. We've had zoonotic diseases emerged, and this will happen again unless we make some real wholesale changes. Now, the one medicine concept has been around for decades, um, which, and that states that human and animal medicine should not be divided, yet we would still have a long way to go to, uh, towards actually actualizing this concept and making and recognizing and using the OLEP definition will be a big step forward in this. Now, discussing as a veterinarian the importance of prevention. So as a veterinarian, and as everyone knows, you look at the investment of prevention versus the cost. Now, there are, eff there are efforts to strengthen our structures in advance of the next pandemic, but sadly, there doesn't seem to be much emphasis on prevention of spillover. So it's been calculated previously that prevention measures to tackle the root causes of pandemics, um, root causes of spillovers of pathogens from animals to humans, requires annual investments of around $20 billion. Compared to the global value of lives lost, that's $350 billion per year. And that's a low estimate. So just that comparison, prevention costs 5% of the cost. And this you also have to consider that doesn't include the estimated $212 billion per year um, 
of economic losses to zoonotic disease. So really from an economic point of view, putting our resources to preventing spillover, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, I mean, I, you can look at it this way. If your house keeps getting flooded, you can get some towels. That might work for a little while. You can go get a mop. That might work for a little while. You might even, if you get flooded again, you might even buy a pump. But if you keep on doing this, how much bigger can your pump be? Wouldn't you be better off finding out why? And then while the, all this is happening, your foundations are getting damaged, your walls are getting damaged, your neighbor's structures are getting damaged. Wouldn't it make more sense to find the cause of these leaks or the cause of where the water is coming in and try to plug it or try to prevent that? So, I mean, it's a, that's, that's the way I look at this. We really need to look at preventing this from happening or at least minimizing the chances of it happening. Um, and the pandemic treaty, simply it won't be effective without an emphasis of prevention, specifically at the stage where spillover happens from animals to humans. Preventing or even minimizing the chances of this will pay dividends. And it's, it's likely that no matter what measures we have for surveillance and response, there's still a great chance that the next pathogen will spread widely before we have a chance to do something to really restrict it. And by that time, we might have had huge damage, particularly to countries that are more economically disadvantaged. Now, going to animals and emerging diseases. So the way we work with and treat animals has again and again led to emergence of zoonotic diseases. You look at the timeline that, my, um, that one of the other speakers put up earlier, so we've had SARS, avian influenza, likely COVID-19, and we don't seem to have learned lessons in this regard. And if we continue to use animals with minimal regard to their health and welfare, we are looking at a ticking time bomb. A few examples that we see today, the way wildlife trade is conducted, simply not tenable. It, it enhances the chances for zoonotic spillover and zoonotic spread and measures need to be taken to prevent this. Fur farming, we've already seen um, new variants, new strains come out through fur farms, and it's something that simply does have to be phased out, and there are countries moving towards that. The way farming systems currently are, they really, they invite the emergence of new diseases, the poor welfare, the sick animals, the cramped spaces, the huge networks, and it's been proven that designing husbandry in a way to foster animal welfare improves the health and well-being of humans and animals, and it reduces the chance of novel pathogen emergence. Also, the dog and cat meat trade carries a lot of the risks you see in farming, and there's mixing with wildlife, and we do feel that the dog and cat meat trade also has to be addressed. Um, simply put, increased surveillance at this time, it will not be enough. Considering the scale of the trade of animals, the only way to address the risk is to look at the paradigms in which we treat and utilize animals and minimize the risk, both for them and for us. And my final point is that this is a huge undertaking, but it can be done as part of a global effort and as a cooperative effort. It's really important that countries with greater re resources assist those in need to build resilient health systems. There needs to be a robust capacity building system Implementing agencies need to be here to guide stakeholders as to what to do, and scientific and legal assistance will be needed to help with the implementation of policy. In some cases, we will have to make hard decisions to minimize the chances of future pandemics, but with every hard decision, there is a positive way forward, and we need to move away from risky practices. So in summary, I'd like to say, while this is a daunting and a huge task to really work on prevention, the focus needs to go to that to minimize spillover. So we need to properly re-examine and rethink the way we interact with animals and do this as part of a truly global effort. Strongly believe this is the only way we're going to prevent another pandemic and have this meeting again in a few years. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Karan. And uh, while well, listening to Jan Wanda, I really asked myself how many more diseases do we need until we really get the action done. And I think we 
uh, do have seen the importance of this concept and, uh, well, of the uh, One Health approach and the uh, well, prevention at a very early stage. Well, we move on how to transform uh, this knowledge now uh, onto, into global policy. And uh, my next speaker is uh, Gianluca Bocci, and he's adjunct professor of international law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies here in uh, Geneva. And he's also academic advisor to the Global Health Center. So, warm well, welcome to you, Gianluca. And, uh, well, I did read your recent paper uh, where you identified clear gaps within global policies when it comes to uh, tackling pandemics. And you wrote about ways to incorporate, actually, the One Health into the instrument to strengthen the PPR concept. Um, can you share your main findings and the gaps you identified with us? And uh, maybe, maybe you can also tell us if these uh, gaps can be addressed in global policy on pandemics, and if yes, how? <laughs> so that's a long question, I know, but... <laughs> Thank you, yes, long question. Uh, many thanks, many thanks to Her Excellency Ambassador Gorley, the Australian Mission for Post for organizing this uh, informal event and for inviting me. Um, good to see many familiar faces in the room. So some of the people here, we remember that uh, as Global Health Center, we had a workshop on this topic a few months ago. Uh, and so that's the paper that we produce for the workshop. If you don't have it, you can find it on our website, governingpandemics.org, very appropriate title. And uh, so I will address a bit of the findings that we uh, reached through this paper, coming to it from a policy and a legal perspective. So we heard uh, quite a redeemed scientist, we heard for posts, if you want more the advocacy part of it. And so we approached it, uh, starting from the same point of view, that we clearly are sitting on a time bomb. We keep bumping into zoonoses that get to worse and worse diseases. And so we do have a problem. And do, we do have a problem in science, we do have a problem in regulation. And the second is the increased emphasis on prevention. I think COVID, if we need a confirmation, shows that when a highly pathogenic disease, in particular of a respiratory na nature, starts spreading, very difficult to control. So the investment in prevention, I think Karen Veer said it very cogently, pays many, many times. So what we try to do is uh, to think of it in policy terms, because One Health, and I think the definition from OLEP is, to me, impeccable. It's surprising it took so long to arrive at this, because it gets all the, uh, in my view, essential ingredients of this landscape together. But obviously, it's very broad and difficult to use it as a concept for regulation, for national and international regulation. So our effort was how to operationalize it, how to narrow it down, how to turn it into something that can be the object of regulation, of, of rights and obligation, of international assistance and cooperation and so on. And we looked at uh, a couple of points. First of all, uh, we treated, and again, if you were at a workshop, uh, you, uh, this sounds familiar, uh, pandemics and other outbreaks, uh, and you use COVID as a, as a benchmark, as a continuum. So the problem doesn't start with the moment the pathogen spills over from an animal to a human. It starts upstream. And as uh, the previous speakers have said, some of the drivers of zoonotic risk are environmental. It's climate change, it's land use change, it's deforestation, it's loss of biodiversity. Uh, it's all the phenomena that are fundamentally man-made that push animals and humans together in a way that wasn't the case before. So we do have upstream problem, what generates these uh, encounter between animals and humans. It's not, this, it's not only that, because obviously this has to do with wildlife. We do have, I think, a big problems with livestock animals. So we also have that, that, um, that aspect. Uh, and that part is regulated at the international level, uh, for better or for worse, there are many improvements, by quite an array of international treaties against biodiversity, desertification, climate change, the protocol on water and health, and so on. And once the, the spillover has occurred, once people get sick, once the disease is spreading, we do have instruments downstream, if you want, that tries to control and to contain 
the problem. The first and foremost is obviously the international health regulations. That doesn't have to do very much with zoonotics, it has to do with human health. But it's there to try to prepare, detect and contain, so downstream. But also trade agreements, for example. Uh, many trade agreements in WTO and elsewhere uh, allow restrictions in international trade to prevent, for example, contaminated food. That has to do with the food chain, it has to do with um, the, the trade in food, going back to the protein demand uh, that the previous speaker was addressing and so on. So we do have, maybe imperfect, but some instruments in the environmental side and the containment and trade side. It seems to us that what is missing is what we call midstream prevention. That is to say, regulating the activities and the places where this encounter between animals and humans take place. And this can be very different depending on the countries. It can be, again, um, subsistence, bushmeat consumption or traditional nutrition practices, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, can be uh, wet markets in Asia can be intensive farming, unregulated fur farming. Karen Vir, I think, mentioned it very cogently in developed countries. So we have different risk profiles. And so it seems to us that there is a space they, uh, that I think is a priority for a future international instrument because it's fundamentally empty. It's this midstream part. And that goes back to uh, what uh, the previous speaker was saying, a real prevention, what we call deep prevention. We will never be able to fully prevent zoonotic spillover, but we should aim at reducing substantially the risk, at identifying the hotspots, at mapping the problems, doing so in a way that doesn't compromise the livelihood of the indigenous community or local communities, and try to uh, devise national and international measures that reduce the risk. Um, and so, what are some of these measures? I cut it short, but uh, and maybe can be part of a conversation. In a paper, we highlighted a, a, a few set of measures that are not coming out of thin air. They come from the environmental experience. They are they've been the object of international uh, study of international practice. The first, and I think Professor Marcotte is very strong on that, is integrated surveillance. We do data collection and surveillance in silos. And so they don't speak to each other, and then how can we prevent? How can we identify? The second is what happens at the national level, uh, regulatory obligation. Uh, and this can be top-down, for example, prohibiting and criminalizing illegal trade in endangered species, but bottom-up also. Try to be aware and, and regulate in a dignified way, in a way that takes into account the needs of local communities, nutrition practices, markets, and so on. The third is science policy interface. We cannot regulate without science. And that's something that comes straight out of environmental policy, on climate change, on biodiversity, there's a lot of experience there. So the need for uh, mechanism, instrument, to collect and, and prepare the scientific basis for regulation. And the fourth is integration at the national and international level. We need, for example, uh, in our view, an all-government approach, like a multi-agency national mechanism where all the various agencies sit together rather than talking at each other from different ministries and so on. And we can have the same thing at an international level, for example, focal points that uh, collect information and provide alert on all these uh, aspects, not just on is is the population getting sick, but animals are getting sick and so on. So then there's a number of of regulatory measures that doesn't seem to me like inventing the wheel because they've been tested before in a different environment but transposable to the problem we are addressing. So that's where you were coming from and we hope this will give some food for, for discussion. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> Gianluca, yes, we will uh, do it later in the discussion. We'll do more and, uh, well, my third speaker here live, live here on stage, is uh, Lawrence Gustin, and he is university professor at Georgetown and the founding only chair in uh, global health law. And he has served on high-level advisory committees for the World Health Organization and is currently working with their global COVID-19 uh, response, including impacts on the health workforce and international migration. And, well, he told me he just flew in from Washington, D.C. this morning, so very warm welcome, a special welcome to you. Great to have you here. Lawrence. 
Yes. <laughs> yes, I was so excited that you came here that I forget my question. That's right. <laughs> I'm so glad you're paying attention to the moderator. Uh, the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic actually revealed how unprepared the world was for such a crisis. Um, as even the most sophisticated public health systems actually failed, failed to cope, we must say, don't we? Um, in your book, Global Health Security, a Blueprint for the Future, you talked about how the solution is not to improve national health policy, um, which can only react, which we've heard before, uh, after the threat is realized at home, but uh, to build up core capacities to prevent zoonotic spillovers, uh, for example. Can you walk us through a little bit what the most important legal obligations are uh, that member states should be looking to include in the pandemic treaty? Yes, thank you. Um, I also wanted to just um, uh, tip my hat to Australia and Four Paws um, for uh, organizing this. Um, also, Sam Hallaby at the O'Neill Institute um, helped me and worked, has been working with uh, me on this and on the pandemic treaty where I'm going to be talking at WHO tomorrow about it. Um, and it's a real, um, real privilege for me to be in this panel. What a, a, an incredible group of um, thinkers um, and advocates. I, there's nothing new I can say that my other panelists haven't said. So I think what I'll do is just reflect on them and also um, try to draw it down to a few key points that they've already um, spoken about. Um, so it's, it's been widely thought that the pandemic instrument would cover four things, um, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. It's very likely that the, uh, the instrument will focus on preparedness and response um, because those are the most tangible, the easiest, the ones that have galvanized the international community um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it's, it's very clear to, to me and to all of us um, that the latter, the, the first and the last, the prevention and the recovery are uh, much more important, in fact, because the international health regulation really is concerning preparedness and response. It talks about core health system capacities, um, international obligations to assist, um, and rapid identification and response. The problem, of course, with the, with the IHR is that they've, um, they haven't been specific enough, they haven't been bold enough, there's very little um, uh, uh, transparency, monitoring, and accountability. And therefore, WHO is kind of moving on um, dual processes, actually three. One is uh, WHO financial sustainability, which already passed the health assembly. Um, but on IHR target amendments and on the uh, pandemic instrument. It's also clear that they need to be coordinating with one another and that there's some really innovative thinking, I think, going on down the street um, uh, in, in, at uh, uh, WHO about how um, we might link those two um, treaties. Um, but the reason that prevention and recovery um, are being kicked down the road is because they're so hard. And they're hard specifically um, because they have very bold, broad um, aspirations, but also because WHO, who is the, really negotiating this treaty and will oversee it, is only one of many organizations that really need to be uh, embracing um, this and negotiating it and uh, to become accountable for it. Um, having said how hard it is and how unlikely it is, I still think it's the most important thing that we can do for the reasons that um, we've heard. Uh, 
something like 70%, as you've heard, of all emerging um, uh, diseases or novel diseases have a zoonotic um, origin. Um, this goes back to the, the great influenza pandemic of 1918 um, through to the modern um, coronavirus um, uh, epidemics, um, SARS, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID pandemic. Um, we've, we discovered it to a horror um, with Ebola in West Africa and then in the uh, DRC, and now monkeypox. And so if the lessons weren't crystal clear for everyone to see, then they're really not looking. Um, and so how do we um, try to operationalize this? I think John Luca very helpfully um, uh, brought us through this, but I want to, uh, as I say, reflect and, and, um, and, and summarize some of the points that he and the other panelists made. One of the key problems is that zoonotic spillovers are much more likely when you have intense human-animal interchange. And so trying to have humane, healthy animal and human populations um, is really the key to preventing the kinds of catastrophic effects um, that we've seen. So what are the kind of specific things we can do? I'm just going to, again, summarize. These are nothing new that you haven't heard. The first one is um, uh, addressing the wildlife trade um, and animal husbandry. Um, uh, wildlife trade and markets that uh, risk zoonotic <coughs> spillovers, particularly commercial trade, in birds and mammals for food, pets, medicine. A lot of that is for the luxury um, market as well. Second is deforestation, um, um, mismanaged land use, uh, forest uh, uh, degradation, um, especially in tropical and subtropical um, uh, areas of the globe. A third is, is that we need to provide better health care and alternative livelihoods for communities living close to wildlife, particularly, for example, indigenous communities. Fourth, we need to strengthen veterinary care and biosecurity in animal husbandry. It's critically important. Fifth, and related to this, and something that I know Europe is very concerned about, um, is managing uh, antibi antimicrobial, but particularly antibiotic use uh, in worldwide agriculture um, with overuse of uh, uh, antimicrobials in farmed animals, um, raising the threats of antimicrobial um, uh, resistant uh, organisms, which is very likely and has been happening at a, at a dramatic rate. But this one thing that scares me even more than a pandemic it's not having the, the medicines and the vaccines um, that are able to cope with those because they become resistant. But there are clear solutions to that. Overlaying all of this seems to me to be the question of equity. Before COVID-19, I always thought that the prevailing global narrative was one of deep injustice. Uh, Martin Luther King um, said um, many wonderful things, but among them, he said that all inequalities are unjust, but the greatest injustice are health inequalities. Um, and we saw that um, with a vengeance with COVID-19. Um, and we saw it with in the inact inequitable distribution of medical uh, global public goods like vaccines, um, therapeutics, diagnostics, personal protection equipment. The One Health approach has a great benefit because it actually embeds equity in it because it mostly um, benefits, but although not exclusively, the most disadvantaged populations. But we need two things, and we hear this from our uh, representatives, particularly from low and 
middle income countries, that they don't want the entire burden of all of these obligations. They need to be shared burdens, and the, the high income countries need to embed equity early on, not just at the end in the equitable allocation of the benefits, but early on in actually taking the hard steps that I've mentioned in preventing the zoonotic spillovers. Um, and so I think right now, I've been in this field, um, well, you can just see my gray hair and no hair. Um, I've been in it a long, long time. Um, and I've never seen a greater tragedy in my time um, with this pandemic. I've never seen greater inequity in my time um, in the way that um, uh, uh, poor people in the world um, have um, suffered in multiple ways, not just with um, burdens of COVID-19, but also childhood immunizations, you know, falling into deep poverty and, 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 uh, and, and stunted development and, the, and, and falling behind on the um, SDGs. Um, but I've also never seen a time of as great opportunity. This is a once in our, in our lifetime. We will never get this chance again, and we need to get it right. And we can get it right, and it seems to me that by focusing on deep prevention is the best way that we can secure uh, a future for our children all over the world with health and justice. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence, and uh, well, all three gentlemen for your interesting, uh, very interesting uh, contributions, and also certainly to uh, Wanda and Natalia. And at this point, uh, Wanda will rejoin us uh, online, I think. Can we have her uh, in the, our round again? Because now it's time for discussion, and uh, um, we will... Yeah, there you are, Wanda. Great to have you back here. Okay. <laughs> Well, I am going to say goodbye now to our online audience, and as I said before, and we will open the floor for discussion here in this room, so it's actually uh, your moment, ladies and gentlemen, and I said again, uh, Chatham House rules, so um, I wonder who wants 